Uh, this is the Virtual Future stage at Future Fest 2018. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and we're blessed to be joined by Douglas Rushkoff this afternoon. So for those of you who are here for the first time, Virtual Futures first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid 90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno-parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. Discussions like this help us to continue the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Today, I'm joined by the prolific media theorist and my friend, Douglas Rushkoff, and this is the title of our talk, and in actual fact, it's an old title of an old talk that you used to give, Douglas, Why Futurists Suck, and this is something you've been thinking about since 1994. So the future that the futurists futurize may not be the one we want. Is that still the case, Doug? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for attending the Virtual Futures stage. The, the, the Why Future is Suck thing came out of um, one of the very first uh, South by Southwest conferences. They invited me to come speak. And they said, oh, you know, our theme is the future, so do a talk about the future. I said, I'll only do, I'll only do a talk about the future if I could talk about Why Future is Suck. And they said, sure, you can talk about it. So I titled my talk, Why Futurists Suck. And the, the idea, really, at the time was I was pissed off because the, the kind of reality hacker, Mondo 2000, cyberpunk uh, techno culture that I was excited about, this culture that believed they, they we were uh, rebuilding or building a new future in the present um, had gotten really co-opted by Wired magazine and the kind of uh, investment futures of Wall Street. And I, I really, what I, what I saw was that, that the future had, had changed from this thing we make in the present to this thing that's going to happen inevitably and all you can do is invest in it. And the way to know which thing to invest in is to buy Wired Magazine and hire Wired Magazine's consultants from the GBN. And they will do the sort of scenario planning, which is really just making a four boxes with, you know, have you ever seen scenario planning where you say, you come up with two axes, like wealth and poverty, high tech, low tech. Then you get these four boxes, like high tech, high wealth, high tech, low wealth, low tech, low wealth, and uh, uh, low tech, high wealth. And then let's imagine those four futures. And then you try to figure out which one are we actually going to go to, and then how do we position Shell Oil for one of those things. And that pissed me off. So it, it felt as if, and I understand how it happened, it, it, it felt as if the future became uh, uh, so, so much about capitalism, really. The future became about uh, uh, sort of wagering your money on a scenario. And what I, what I did was, you know, I looked uh, in that talk, I looked at uh, uh, Arist Aristotle's uh, narrative arc. There's a crisis climax relief, that sort of male orgasm curve of, nar of narrativity that shapes capitalism, Christianity, communism, everything. You know, crisis climax sleep. Um, and, and looked at that in, in terms of this, this digital wave that they were calling the tsunami that was going to come, and this, this, uh, uh, that if we maintained that look, we were going to end up in a kind of more uh, apocalyptic, dehumanized, uh, every man for himself, winner takes all type scenario, rather than the one that a genuinely networked digital technology might uh, 
offer us. So I said why futurists suck because they were the folks who were saying, oh, this is what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. The job of a futurist is not to say what's going to happen. The job of a futurist should be to empower people in the present to create the future they want to see happen. The future as a verb, the future as a thing we make, rather than the future as some noun at which we arrive. And I felt like the futurists were among the most uh, coercive agents of the uh, capitalist reclaiming of a commons-based phenomenon. Well, today, to fast forward into the 21st century, today we have kind of futurists and they're making futures. It's the folks who have this mimetic power like Elon Musk, who can use the future to change his stock market valuation in the present. So Elon makes some grandiose claim that he's going to send whatever to the stars or do some solar thing over here. And suddenly yeah. you see points in his stock market valuation suddenly increase in the present. He's using the future as a way to, to leverage yeah. The present, Bezos does it very well. Even, He's trading the fear, in the future. Even the fake fear. It's like when Elon Musk says, oh, one thing I'm really concerned about is AI being smarter than us. And what are we going to do? What is that? It's an AI salesman. It's saying that AI, as if, the, as if what they're doing, even when Zuckerberg and uh, uh, Elon Musk have this debate about the future of AI, and, and Zuckerberg is saying, oh, don't worry, it's going to be friendly and good and love us and fuck us and whatever, and Musk saying, oh, no, it's going to overtake us. Still, the underlying assumption is that it's going to be as smart or smarter than people. That's the accepted. So, so the frame of the argument itself is their victory, and that's, you know, and that's the problem. And, and the, the, the reason why... Uh, I think it's, it's valid now. What I've been thinking about and writing about lately is the way that this brand of futurism has made Silicon Valley the most uh, ultimately powerless people on the block. That these are the people, you, you talk to the, the billionaires, that's the ones I'm writing about now, talk to the real billionaires, they look at the future of technology as various escape plans from us whether it's a rocket ship to Mars, you're not going on the rocket ship to Mars, sorry. You're not going there. You're not getting in the compound protected by you know, cyber robots in New Zealand for, for after climate change. You know, you're not, we're not going along for that ride. So the, the technology development they're doing and the, the, some of the crazy meetings I'm getting called into to try to help them plan for the future is they're literally asking me questions like, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event <laughs> because their money's worthless what do they do you know do they put collars or something that they you know, what yeah wow is right wow and so and so it's it's there's an insanity to it and and when i try to trace it back i trace it back to the original why future is suck moment it's because people are looking at the future as this this inevitability at which they arrive you know or the singularity is this inevitability that humanity gets to so if we give up on the future as something that we're making in the present then we've basically given up on free will we've given up on humanity we've given up on on anything like like agency and that as I see it, was the point of the people who quashed the Mondo 2000 cyberdelic revolution of the early 1990s. The humans were escaping their cages. They were starting to create their own uh, mindsets, their own pictures of the world, their own new social arrangements. And that's scary. We can do it as individuals. You know, you can manipulate your body or put in a chip or change your gender. You can do it as an individual. But once you start doing it as a collective, once you start doing it in solidarity, that's where they get mad. Well, there's no such thing as the future, is there? There's only futures, and they're always mad as each other. So you got, you're talking about the no future folk who believe that something's going to kill us, whether it's an asteroid, AI, synthetic biology, right. some crazy thing is going to cause the inevitable end of the world. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the folks who believe they're going to live ad infinitum, uploading their minds into computers, cryogenically freezing their bodies, replacing their body parts ad infinitum. I mean, the future is up for grabs, and it just it seems like we've just split and gone everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the vision of the future that's shared by the, the too much of the techno-positive positivist community is an individualized future. You know, I get my goggles on, I get my implant in, I get my thing, I, I, I yeah. upload my consciousness to a, to a fucking silicon chip. 
You know, I, I'm, the reason I wouldn't want to upload my consciousness to a silicon chip is I'm not that interesting. I'm not that interested in myself. You know, I'm so much more interested in connecting with other people laterally than connecting with myself uh, or, or, or sustaining some uh, uh, single, single isolated bit. You know, what is this really? You know, what is the desire to live as a single unit forever is really a fear of intimacy expressing itself as technofuturism. Well, I uh, think it's a lack of imagination as well. So the weird thing about the transhumanists is they want to fix something. Not fix as in Not something's repair. broken yeah. and repair, but fix as in this is good, let's either freeze it or let's upload it or let's just stop this moment right now in the 21st century because lucky gold star life is good right now and I want this to continue ad infinitum. They're Lock interested in the future. They're interested in preserving right now. Right. And the scary thing is you see it on the supposed good side. You see it, you know, you. You, you scratch a progressive a little too hard, and what you see under it is, well, now they're afraid that their progressive policies might make it so, at least in America, so now black children maybe are gonna be competing against their kids to get into college. Oh, wait a minute. That advantage that we had, we're gonna sort of lose? I'm all happy for black people to have equal rights as long as my kid still gets into Harvard, right? I mean, wait a minute, wait a minute. So there, the that survival, uh, survival instinct, as if it matters what fucking college your kid goes to, you know, it matters what books they read. I, I mean, there's, that's another, I mean, the branding of education is an, a real fun one to get into. And what, and, and how is the branding of education uh, uh, enforced by, again, fear of the future? Oh, the future's gonna be really hard for your kid if they don't have a really good primo, you know, card-carrying member of the Ivy League or Cambridge or Oxford, they're not gonna be able to compete in the robotized future. Again, oh, we gotta compete. You know, and that's, that, that's the thing that's, that, ugh, that's just drawing at me. But you're right, you know, the, the, this, this, this kind of techno-solutionism is, is less about solving problems than neatening things, than being, it's falling into the digital media environment's trap of everything is discrete, everything has a label, every, everything is addressed and tagged. You know, and if it can't be tagged, it doesn't exist. If it can't, doesn't have an address, it doesn't, it's not around. And that's why human beings have become the problem in this, in this world. Human beings are the problem and technology is the solution. And that's, trouble once we're starting to think about that. So it's how do we fix humans to optimize them for the digital platforms that we've built rather than how do we optimize digital platforms for the human beings who exist. So if, the, if it's the case that the future is being leveraged against us collectively, then how do we co-opt it? How do we take it back? What can we start doing to have a little bit of ownership, just a little bit of our future and our collective futures I mean, some of it is, is social, spiritual. You know, it's, it's forging solidarity with other people. You know, I'd rather look in the eyes of a capitalist than be online with a communist. You know, if, really, I mean, it's, it's organismic connection. Welcome to, welcome to Future Fest, by the way. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Some interesting stages. We no, but I mean, 300,000 years of human evolution is on our side. And the, the way we, we reclaim that and activate that is by being, again, in real spaces with real people in real time, looking into people's eyes, establishing rapport, feeling what happens when your breathing sync up, when your pupils get bigger and the other persons get bigger and you get mirror neurons, stuff happens. Stuff happens. Solidarity is real. When we used to work side by side with other workers on the assembly line, we could establish a kind of solidarity that we can't as Amazon mechanical Turks when we're when we're physically isolated from one another. When we're Skyping with each other, we don't get the feedback, the, the human biological feedback that we get in real life. We get some of it, but not enough. And the person says, I agree with you, I feel for you, and we see them, but we don't really get all of the, the cues that we normally get biologically. We don't see the breathing rate, we don't see the pupils, so on some level, we don't trust that other person. We don't blame the technology for the lack of fidelity and the connection. We blame the other human being for not delivering the mirror neurons, the oxytocin that we came to expect. So we become less trusting of each other. And that's sort of how it all degrades. So I, I think the easiest way back is spending time in real places with real people. That's 
sort of where it starts. And then once you're doing that, then you begin to fight for those opportunities. Well, why don't we have a place to meet up? Why aren't we allowed to meet up? Why, what's going on here? And then slowly we uh, kind of try to rebuild society from the bottom up. But it's really tricky when, you know, as in the previous conversation, we're living in a world where all of our resources are being extracted, all, you know, our, our economy is being monopolized, our you know, planet is being heatened. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky moment to do that, but uh, I don't think we can let the urgency of the situation, uh, if, we, if we panic and go individual as a result of it, if we panic and start storing stuff in our basement, not to last an extra week, but to last forever, um, that's, when, uh, that's when things go down. So what about the opportunity of retrieving something from the mid-90s? We lost well, we're losing quite quickly most of the cyberpunks, but there was something hopeful in that message, in that vision. Do, do we need some retrieval of the cyberpunk vision, or can we create something else? And please don't let it be like etherpunk, which is based on Ethereum, or, or blockpunk, which is a blockchain bullshit thing. Like, let it be something real. Well, if you're really going to retrieve the cyberpunk, then what you want to do is retrieve late medievalism. You know, what you do is you look at the last big renaissance, the last big renaissance you know, we, we celebrate it because they won history. But what was the last big renaissance? Was bringing back Greek and Roman values of centralization and state and corporatism and national boundaries and the collapse of the city-state and uh, 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 repression of women and and uh, and peer-to-peer -peer activities. So if we're going to retrieve something, I think we retrieve the local peer-to-peer -peer marketplace of late medieval Europe. We look at what happened when we got central currency. We look at what happened when we got chartered monopolies. And we retrieve the things that were repressed in the last renaissance and then renaissance, rebirth those in our era. And we see the beginnings of it in culture. You see it in sort of Burning Man and craft beer and, and uh, uh, piercing and scarification. And uh, I mean, you see some of it, even in a Game of Thrones, God bless them, I mean, I know, but you see, there's, there's a, a curiosity, there's a hunger for something of that period, we realize we left, we left something behind. So I would, I would retrieve that. But, but then the problem is that the speed of cultural evolution means all those wonderful things that are being retrieved get quickly co-opted. So Burning Man, Google has a camp, or at least uh, Eric, uh, Eric, uh, uh, who was with the CEO of um, Google, right. he, he has his Burning Man camp, and all of these things are being, oh, oh, that looks right. like a little that's bit of reality. Whole, right. Let's, let's that's have why, a look at that, we have to, That's why we have to uh, uh, resist the 20th century uh, uh, temptation to institutionalize anything that works. If it worked, I did an event in 2011 called Contact. All these people came to New York and it was all about taking back the net and folding the weird fringes back to the middle. And it was super successful and it was fun and we launched all these great technologies and Spiral had a big uh, a surge because of it. And uh, then people said, oh, when are you gonna do it? Is it next year or is it every two years? It's like, no, we did it. That was it. And and that almost to be, to, to uh, accept the, the temporariness, to accept transitory. I mean, we did a Burning Man. It was great. Now someone else is going to do something there, and someone else is something there. It's like once you try to lock it down, um, is that's when they can target you. That's when they can. Uh, that's when they can figure it out. You know, if we accept the sort of plasticity and 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 change in it, um, it becomes a little bit easier. I mean, it's in some ways that was, and I still don't have the. the fullest answer, but that was the beauty of the Occupy movement, was its refusal to sort of state, this is exactly what we want, this is what, it was this sort of uh, a, a, new, uh, a new way of being, which is why I like their theme for this thing, Occupy the Future. You know, it's really, to occupy the future, you occupy the present. But, but still, just the idea of let us occupy reality, let us actually just be here now, as, as Ralph would have said, um, or did say, uh, it's sort of, that's why it's, and I don't mean to sound woo or too spiritual about it, because it's not woo and spiritual. It's so much more real than abstract intellectual, you know, cyber blah blah. You know, it's 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 present. So in other words, embrace ephemerality, embrace wonderful yeah little I mean, moments. We're all stuck in a fucking hot room and just well right. And I was oh, wasn't that great? Yeah, wasn't this great? Oh, what lens you can take? What lessons can we take from that? And Everything's a prototype. Everything's changing. It's just don't you don't get your IPO 
right? You don't get well, then, your stock but, ticker. But then, but then, that's, that's the moment of doom. But that becomes the problem because everything has to grow. We've got this weird human growth imperative thing where there's, it's, it's whether a, it's got an evolutionary basis or a cultural it basis. It doesn't. It's a central currency basis. When we invented central currency, which was in order to outlaw all the local currencies that people were using in sustainable markets that were optimized for the velocity of currency and the volume of transaction. Those were made illegal by monarchs who were getting poor as the merchant class got wealthy. That was it. And they invented central currency, which you have to borrow at interest from a central treasury in order to transact. And you've got to pay back more than you borrowed. Any system where you have to pay back more money than you borrowed has to grow. So once you take capital, you have to grow. That's the problem with the money we use. And we accept it as if that's the only money there ever was. We've forgotten that we've fought wars over this, that, that, that uh, Philip the Fair had to send the Knights Templar to quell money rebellions when he tried to institute central currency in France. I mean, this is, uh, uh, of course we forget, you know, but the little things are coming back. I mean, you know, you, Bitcoin is, is, is kind of trying in a certain way. I mean, as a thought experiment, I like it the best, but then look at how everyone then wants to invest in it. Yeah. Say, oh, let's just invest in this tagging system. Let's invest in this ledger, you know, and, and, and render it unuseful. The best thing that could ever happen to Bitcoin and Ethereum is this devaluation that's happening now. So it's a usable money rather than, than more gold. I mean, instead of it trickling one way or trickling another way, should we just be comfortable with perhaps an impeding collapse? John Perry Barlow was like, it's not a construction project. The internet's not gonna be a construction project, but it has become a construction project. So are we about time for a demolition? Huh. Well, it, 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 demol it demolishes itself, I mean, in, in certain ways. It's gonna collapse under its own dead weight. Is that what you're hoping? Well, certain, I'm not hoping that, I mean, I, I, I don't need to hope for something uh, you know, bad to happen to internet companies in order for the people to be liberated. Um, but I, I do still kind of, if I'm gonna future cast, I foresee a, a widespread nausea developing. I, people will go on Facebook or any of these things and it's just nauseating, it's just, Ugh, you know, it's, it's that, ugh. And then it's like, oh, I could be playing with my three-year-old. And that's not nauseating. It's really fun. Um, and then it's just like, what is it for? Don't you, I mean, didn't you as a kid, I mean, every kid who goes goth, and I, I'm assuming most people in this room at least had some goth period. Every kid who goes goth, right before you go goth, there's this period where you think, what is pleasure anyway? What is pleasure? What? Do I even want, do I want money? No, do I want things? No, do I like this? I, kind of like sex, I guess. <laughs> Except I have to have it with some other person. Um, you know, so there's that, there's that moment when it's like nothing is like, there's nothing I could buy that's gonna make me happy. And, and I think that's gonna happen too. There's nothing I can click on that's actually gonna give me the dopamine or the oxytocin or the, the, the neurochemical that I'm looking for. Um, and then, and then it'll, it'll deflate of its own accord, and, and we will hopefully find each other in time to, to yeah. rescue our planet. So I'm gonna let you all leave this room and check your notifications on your phone, but before you do, I wanna end with this, which is a reminder for those interested in the future, and it's, it's how we frame every single one of our virtual futures uh, conference, uh, every, uh, every one of our virtual futures talks, uh, let me correct that, um, which is this. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable, never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction. There's still hope. Although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Um, please join me in thanking the incredible Douglas Rushkoff. Thank you.